Now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Chad Harris. Dr. Harris is a senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Johannesburg, South Africa. He is director of the department's African Center for Epistemology and Philosophy of Science, the ACEPS, and works under the ACEPS project, Rationality and Power. His other research interest is in the methodology of social science, especially the problem of external validity. I hand it over to you. Thank you. Get my presentation going. Okay, if you could just give me a thumbs up if you can see it and it's... Okay, excellent, thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, before I begin, I just need to uh, make one announcement. If during the course of my presentation, you uh, hear some chanting or some singing, it's because we are having some protest action um, on campus. And uh, it was uh, audible slightly earlier this afternoon, just outside my, uh, my window. I don't know if it will come back, um, but if it does, don't be alarmed. Um, these are protests around um, financial exclusion of, of poor students um, and uh, basically uh, problems with the registration process of the students who are on financial aid schemes. Um, and it's actually an appropriate way to begin what I'm going to say because I join you um, from our campus in Johannesburg where our thinking about decolonization began um, with a similar protest. And this was around 2015 or 2016 um, with what was known as the roads must fall and fees must fall movement, which was a basically a movement from students from the ground up saying that institutional culture in South Africa's university needed to change. Uh, the um, lists of demands included things like financial exclusion and uh, more access to to tertiary education, but it also involved things related to institutional culture and epistemic decolonization. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that, uh, you know, being invited to this platform to speak about epistemic decolonization, I, I wondered whether the invite came to a, you know, a South African, someone teaching in this context, uh, with the assumption that we've been at decolonization for a lot longer than it's been going on in the West, or that you know we have we because we've been doing it for much longer, we have deeper insights into what epistemic decolonization is. But just to give you some background um, about our recent uh, the, the decolonization debate is in South Africa, um, even at an institution like UJ with uh, a demographic that reflects South Africa's demographic, which is. Uh, overwhelmingly uh, Black African. Uh, we had our first module on African philosophy uh, in 2017. Um, so we've had a political decolonization that began in 1994, but we've been lagging behind with other aspects of decolonization and epistemic decolonization and decolonization of the academy um, has been really late to the game. And it's something that we still feel we are figuring out um, and something we still feel that we are catching up on, especially when it comes to the rest of the continent and to some other places in the world that have been having these debates and these discussions for, for much longer. Um, and for that reason, um, I thought it would be a good idea to speak to uh, the decolonization advice that I think comes from the, the book that I, I mentioned in my title. So this is a book by an Australian uh, philosopher of science, her uh, name's Helen Vedden, and she did some really interesting work um, in post-independence Nigeria in the, the 1960s and 1970s. So Nigeria was one of the, the states to gain independence a lot earlier than South Africa. Um, and so they, they sort of entered this era of decolonization decades before South Africa. Uh, and at the time, what was going on was that Nigeria received uh, assistance from the international community, um, basically to pump money into infrastructure and also pump money into education. So the way Vedin comes to uh, write about Nigeria is that she goes to Nigeria post-independence um, and teaches in a Nigerian university. 
where a problem or a task is to educate the cohort of people who will become the teachers in the, the post-independent schools in Nigeria uh, that have been opened because of this injection of funding and infrastructure. So the book addresses uh, what she terms a public problem. And that is the, the teaching of mathematics and science in these new founded Nigerian schools and in Nigerian society. Um, there's some tensions in the book that, you know, we see parallels with uh, in the South African context and in, in other post-independence um, uh, countries in, in Africa. Um, the book speaks about this constant tension between the developmental imperative. Okay, so the reason you want uh, education in mathematics and science in, in these schools is so that you, you develop a cohort of, of students, of scholars, who are then able to meet the developmental goals of a place like Nigeria. And it's a, a similar tension happening in South Africa, uh, where you have to balance that on the one hand and this decolonization imperative on the other hand, which we saw with, with the Dodes Must Fall uh, movement. The, so those are the sort of practical uh, issues in the, the forming the background of this book. In terms of the more theoretical issues, uh, the book's written in the wake of what was termed rationality debates, which uh, in African philosophy, uh, you know, we, we study as, as the first time the West starts to get to grips with what it means uh, to work towards, uh, you know, the forging together of scientific rationality in cultures that don't share a similar sort of uh, conceptual system. Um, so in the words of, or, or the terms of anthropology and philosophy of science at the time, the debate was between traditional African beliefs and scientific rationality, or in even uh, stronger, maybe more uh, odious terms, it was about scientific rationality and primitive rationality. And Vedin's book uh, sort of acknowledges that debate and comes up with a, a new way of seeing what the tensions were in that debate. Um, so the way she sets up the book is uh, through a series of vignettes or, or stories about what she noticed when she taught this cohort of, of teachers who would go into Nigerian schools and the difference between the way she teaches the correct way to teach a lesson uh, and the way the lesson actually gets implemented when they, when they get to uh, the practical application of that lesson. So she's got lots of these vignettes, these sketches, uh, but the two I'll focus on in, in the time I have uh, were the, the lessons that uh, a teacher called Mr. Ojo and uh, a teacher called Mrs. Babatunde gave their classes. So the aim of these si basic science lessons, and we're speaking about primary school level, uh, was to teach the scientific uh, concepts of length and volume. So this is a, a, a lesson we all went through in school. Um, it's you know quite standard, quite basic. Uh, the aim of the first lesson was to get the students to understand the concept of length. And the way Verin set up the lecture, the way she explained to the teachers how, how the lesson would go, um, especially in the context of limited resources, was that they would have one uh, measuring board, okay, in, in the corner of a classroom, one, one device where you could measure length, but they would have uh, pieces of rope, pieces of string, that they would use uh, to stretch from the, the tip of the student's toe until the, the top of the head. And then the student would go up to the measuring board like you see in the picture and measure what, what the length of, of different students in, in the class is. Um, similarly with Mrs. Babatunde's uh, lesson, it was a lesson on volume. Um, and the way they decided on teaching this lesson was that they would set up some sort of device that would allow uh, air to replace water in a container. Um, and you would take a deep breath, you would blow into this container, and the amount of water that gets displaced would represent uh, the, the volume, the capacity of your lungs. Uh, in, in the lecture, uh, it was a simple process, but what Verin noticed is that both of these, these teachers would introduce an intervening step between uh, the, you know, the, the first measurement in, in the first case of the string um, and the ultimate measurement of length or volume. So for example, uh, Mr. Ojo, uh, when he implemented his lesson, instead of 
instructing the students to take this thing directly to the measurement board, what he would do is he would give each student a small length of card. Okay. Um, and he would instruct them to take this length of card, which was marked with centimeter readings. And he would tell them to wind the string. Sorry, the, the power is just gone. I'll move closer. It should be fine. Uh, what he would do is uh, wind the string around the length of cardboard and get them to measure length by multiplying the length of the cardboard strip um, by the amount of strings that were wound around, around the board. Uh, similarly, Mrs. Babatunde, instead of measuring the, uh, the amount of water displaced in a measuring cylinder, would insist that the students take small jugfuls uh, and measure how many of those jugfuls made, made up what was in the, the measuring cylinder and then multiply that by whatever the capacity of the, the, the small jug was. Now, initially, this caused uh, Vedan to question what was going on in the lesson. Okay. She, in, her, in her words, initially, she was scandalized by what was going on. Um, because while she acknowledged that these teachers had gotten the students to get the right result, I mean, they, they all get the right measurement at the end of the day, she feels or she felt that they were going about it in the wrong way. And specifically what she felt the problem was, was that uh, they were getting the right measurements, but the ultimate aim of the lesson was being lost somehow. So for example, if you, if you take an entity like length or extension um, and you strip it to a plurality, uh, you've sort of subverted the lesson in a way. You've, you've, uh, you've taken uh, the essence of what length is or the notion of length, and you've turned it into something else entirely. Same thing with volume. If you want to teach a child about lung capacity, uh, you refer to that as a unity, as a singularity, uh, but to split it, split it up so that you can only measure that singularity by splitting it into jugfuls, into a plurality, uh, subverts the lesson in a, specific, in, in a specific sense. And so she takes issue with, with the way these classes are conducted. But she notices another thing. She notices that teachers like Mr. Ojo and Mrs. Babatunde, who subvert the message of her lectures, go on to present very successful classes in the sense that their students understand what's going on and get the right sort of measurements at the end of the day. Whereas other teachers who implement her lectures, uh, you know, very literally, who take her advice and implement it exactly the way she suggests, lose the class somehow. So they don't quite grasp, you know, how to go about measuring length. They don't quite grasp how to go about measuring volume. And it's this, uh, you know, this uh, feeling of disconcertment is what she terms it all, uh, that gets her thinking about what it is that these teachers know and that, that these teachers understand about teaching in this post-colonial context that she's missing as an outsider. And this is the impetus for the book. This is the impetus for the ideas uh, she ends up presenting in, in her book. Now, she points out that at the time, just given the, the political uh, debate at the time and what people are saying about African independence um, and also the epistemologies underlying these political positions, the only things she can turn to are, are two outlooks that she feels could guide her in, in understanding what goes wrong in this lesson. So on the one hand, she's got a, a right-wing or universalist uh, understanding or explanation of what's going on. Um, and this is underpinned by a universalist epistemology. And according to this way of looking at, at things, uh, Mr. Ojo and Mrs. Babatunde are presenting lessons that ultimately fail. Um, they fail because the children are not understanding the essence of the scientific concept that is meant to be departed uh, in this lesson. So according to a universalist and that sort of epistemology, uh, both of those teachers, Mr. Ojo and Mrs. Babatunde, should be blamed for not teaching the canon properly. Okay? They are not teaching the concept of length in the warranted or the established way. Um, and what underpins this idea or this epistemology is the idea that there are structures in the world that provide a foundation for valid knowledge in the sense that the reason we teach uh, students to measure length in a specific way is because 
uh, things in the real world possess this quality of length and they are warranted scientific ways for how we measure that quality, how we understand that quality and how we measure it. So if there's any fault uh, to a portion in, in this context, it needs to go with uh, the teacher for using flawed methods. Um, and to the extent that the children only understand the lesson in the way that Mr. Ojo teaches it, uh, that you know the children and their sort of culture is, is at, at fault for not understanding the essence of the scientific lesson. On the other hand, she has recourse to a, uh, a left-wing analysis of the situation in Africa. Um, and according to this left-wing analysis, the lesson has to be considered a success. Um, these teachers have been innovative in bringing in indigenous knowledge um, and the understanding of the background of, of these students um, to change, to modify the scientific message and to present it in a way that they know uh, children will, will understand. Um, in this sort of outlook, it's social practices such as language that form the foundation for knowledge, uh, not necessarily structures in the world. And if we are going to apportion blame, uh, in this case, it's with the curriculum that's being taught, uh, which in this context is just not suitable for the people who are supposed to be receiving the lesson. Now, Helen uh, Verden goes to, Na to Nigeria with the aim of conducting a relativist critique of universalist epistemology. This, I mean, she acknowledges that this, this is a starting position at the beginning. But over time, and as she's developing ide uh, ideas and developing the book, she realizes that it, in, in, an, in analyzing what's going on in the classroom, both of these positions are ultimately going to fail. And she says they are going to fail because both of them rely on something she calls foundationism. And uh, basically foundationism is the idea that there's some sort of foundation for knowledge set in stone. Okay, in the one, in the one case for your universalist, uh, what's set in stone is uh, structures in the world. Uh, whereas for the relativist, uh, what's set in stone is the cultural practices of, of these children. Now, the reason she ultimately rejects relativism as a form of foundationism is because in her words, it closes possibilities. So initially she's attracted to, to this sort of analysis and this sort of critique of what's going on with universalist epistemology. But ultimately, she realizes that it's not going to work. It, it, it's actually going to cause more harm than, uh, than it's worth uh, because it closes the possibility of, of understanding, number one, the ingenuity of these, of these teachers, right? So if it's the case that you only have these two different sorts of foundation for knowledge, uh, then how is it that these teachers recognize that this sort of lesson is not going to work in this context? Uh, because the, the relativist assumes that there's only one or the other foundation and that the two things are incompatible. Uh, she also does studies on bilingual Yoruba children. Um, and she realizes that they also have this ability to not just code switch, uh, but to understand which aspects of, of which conceptual scheme is the appropriate one to use for specific tasks and functions. Um, and so she's on the hunt for something different besides these two foundationist categories that will allow her to explain her sense of disconcertment and also open up new possibilities for the way decolonization can be done. And I think it's this aspect of uh, Vedan's work that points to some lessons that we could potentially use um, as people interested in this question of exactly what epistemic decolonization is. So the what she does is she goes on to look for other explanations for what's going on to cause a sense of disconcertment. So not just to, to rest on, the, on you know, the, the assumption that these two things are different, these two generalizing logics or way of understanding the world is different, but she looks for why. And what I want to share in this talk is kind of the fundamental insight that she notices about the difference between Yoruba children explain their practices and explain the world versus what an English speaker, for example, would, would use to explain the world. And it basically has to do with uh, a difference in the two languages. Now, uh, if we take a simple sentence, uh, so in English, let's uh, take the sentence, he saw three dogs. Um, and if you, if you looked at, say, a, 
a Yoruba dictionary translation of that English sentence uh, or vice versa. It would imply that when Yoruba speakers use their sentence, it has uh, an identical meaning. Okay, so when an English person says that sentence, he means he saw three dogs. And when a Yoruba speaker uses that, you know, that collection of words, he means exactly the same proposition. But what this hides, according to Verdon, is that there's actually a deep difference in, if you look at the grammatical mechanisms underpinning those sentences. A Yoruba speaker is not saying exactly the same thing as the English speaker say. Okay, and uh, I mean, th this sentence uses dogs, but maybe a simpler explanation is, imagine holding a handful of peanuts. For someone who's raised speaking English or who's raised in a culture where, you know, for want of a better term, uh, enlightenment, modernity uh, is kind of underpinning the language and the use of the language, you see the peanuts in your hand as a collection of objects, as a collection of spatio-temporal particulars. Um, whereas for a Yoruba speaker, there's a completely different dynamic going on, whatever the, the object is that you're viewing. So with the peanuts, they're not primarily seeing peanuts as a collection of individual objects, as a collection of individual peanuts. What, what they are noticing is peanut matter uh, divided up in a specific way, or in the case of this sentence, uh, dog matter uh, manifesting here now as a collection divided to the extent of three. So again, if you think back to those lessons, you can now begin to see why those teachers have this understanding that if I present the lesson the way you want me to present it, I can foresee that the, there are going to be gaps in understanding uh, because the language is different, but also because the generalizing logic that that language generates is, is going to be completely different. Now, one of the uh, ways she, she explains, you know, the, the repercussions for this difference in, in the grammar of the language um, is in terms of the numbering system. So another interesting difference she points out is how Yoruba numbers differ from English or you know, uh, Indo-European numbers. Uh, so the Yoruba don't work off of a, a decimal system. Okay, They don't work off of a base 10 system. Um, instead, they've got a vigesimal system where they group numbers uh, in groups of 20. So as an illustration, uh, you know, the, the way we count in English is, let's say we're counting from 40 up, uh, we just add individual uh, individuals onto 40 until we get up to 50, until the next 10, and then we start the process again. Whereas in Yoruba numeration, uh, you do a similar thing up to 44, uh, but when you get to 45, it's not just by adding one to 44, you need to jump to the next vigesimal point, which is 60, and then subtract 10 and subtract five. And our explanation is that the dynamic um, of going from one to many is, is, is while it's you know, ingrained in the English use of numbers, in Yoruba, you don't have a similar one-many dynamic going on. In fact, you have a more of a whole part dynamic in the same way as you identify a collection of peanuts and then decide what the appropriate division is. The same thing works with the way Yoruba deal with numbers. And so these two things, uh, you know, explain number one, the disconcertment in those lessons, uh, but they also explain, you know, how much is missing in the decolonization debate. And so if we look at what's going on, I think uh, Verdun's work, specifically that insight into the way the two languages work, the way the generalizing logic works, um, and the way the understanding of basic concepts, including scientific concepts works, points to some uh, advice that we could take on board when understanding epistemic decolonization. Uh, so the first one that I'm, I'm gonna speak about is this idea of overcoming foundationism. So you remember uh, Vedan says the idea of foundationism is that there's somehow a, a foundation or a justification for our knowledge that you know, exists somewhere out there kind of set in stone um, and our job as epistemic agents is to become familiar with what those foundations are. Um, and a problem with foundationism, as I explained, or, or let me say why it's a problem in the, the context of decolonization, um, is because it implies that decolonization is about replacing one foundation with a different foundation. So in Verdun's terms, you know, if, if you wanted to decolonize 
knowledge in the Yoruba context, it looks like all you have to do is identify the analog of the foundation that's playing the part in the English context, find that Yoruba analog or the echo of the, the European uh, modernity foundation and replace the one with the other. So if you take African ideas, African concepts, African conceptual schemes, plug them into the, you know, where the Western scheme was, um, then you've decolonized successfully. Um, and obviously, given what she's told us, this just isn't going to work, okay? And I think a similar thing's been going on in the way we've been thinking about decolonization in, in the South African context up to now. Um, and so this is advice we should take on board. For example, up to now, the decolonization debate in, in South African universities has been about, well, which African authors do we include on, on course lists and in the place of what? So if we are teaching a course in philosophy of science, who do we uh, use to replace Hume, for example? If we're gonna get rid of Hume, where is the African author or the, the set of African ideas that can do the same job uh, that Hume's doing? Now, obviously, um, number one, uh, there, there isn't such an author, there isn't such a collection of ideas. And number two, why should there be? You know, these people um, are writing in different contexts, they are taking on different problems, um, they, are, they are writing for a different culture, for a different people. And so it stands to reason that the things they write about and the way they write are not going to be suitable uh, if they are transplanted into a different context. Uh, so the first sort of uh, advice for moving forward in the epistemic decolonization debate is this idea of overcoming foundationism. And if, if variance to be believed, this is a more formid formidable opponent even than universalism. Um, you know, as she says, even relativism falls into the, uh, the fault of foundationism. Uh, the second thing is looking at the language or the translation question. So if you noticed what, what was going on uh, when we sort of had a, a loose translation of, of a sentence in English to a, a sentence in Yoruba, is that we often do this curve fitting exercise where in order to make the speaker of one language understand another language, we leave out some detail that we feel isn't important for the translation, but does become important when, wash, when it washes out in philosophical analysis. And often what that detail is, is details related to what uh, Vedan refers to as the ontic dimension. So uh, obviously points number two and three are going to be uh, related, but let me explain the, the translation problem uh, with an anecdote from a Ugandan uh, poet and philosopher uh, called Okot Bitek. So uh, Bitek in his poetry uh, writes about these issues of of what gets lost in translation, specifically in the context of Christianity becoming the dominant religion in Uganda. So he has a, a quote in one of his poems where he, he calls uh, Ugandan Christians uh, the followers of the hunchback. And that's because when the first Italian priests get to Uganda, uh, you know, and start converting people, uh, they, they hit uh, an obstacle, a hurdle, in that the uh, the language that Bitek speaks doesn't have a verb for creating something out of nothing. Okay, so there's, there's a verb for using some sort of raw material to, to fashion something, to create something, uh, but there's no word for creation uh, without an underlying material, and so there's no word for the creator. And so in order to, to explain this idea of God as the creator, they start quizzing people in the community to say, uh, who forged you? You know, who created you? Uh, and they battle to, to understand what these priests are getting at until one person hits on the idea that the only way you really explain what, what it means to be created or forged, uh, the example he uses is to say, well, what does it mean to be molded? And his explanation is that, well, if you look the way you looked before and then you contracted something like rubella, uh, which would give you a hunchback, that would mold you into something different. And so these priests, they, uh, you know, think they did on the word uh, for molding, for creation. Um, and so they translate the scriptures and, and the religious message into one saying that they are there to spread the message of this hunchback movement. And so for a while in Uganda, Christianity is associated with, with being hunchbacked. 
but no one really understands the reason until you know this this issue in translation uh, gets spelled out. Uh, so again, it's it's a question we've been tackling in the context of South Africa and the decolonization of, of our philosophy curriculum and our institutions. Uh, but again, it's one way I don't think we've really made much progress. Uh, just to explain, uh, last year we implemented something called language tutors uh, for our undergraduate courses. South Africa has uh, nine official languages, um, and Johannesburg is quite a uh, you know diverse cosmopolitan city. And so, as a lecturer at UJ, you need to be aware that uh, the majority of the class that you lecture to as English as a second or even third or even fourth language. Um, and so what we decided was that we would employ uh, tutors who were proficient in most of the, of the official languages. And we felt that this would be a way of, of bypassing the language issue when it came to you know, explaining philosophical ideas. Uh, but again, we hit a snag with that because we didn't realize the, the difficulty of this sort of deep translation. So it's one thing to say, I'll have a speaker of X in my class and they'll be able to relay the, the content that I'm teaching to speakers of that language, but it doesn't always work like that because there isn't always a good translation of philosophical ideas, uh, philosophical arguments, uh, philosophical traditions into, into different languages. And so often even, even people who speak those languages say to us, look, let's just stick to the English because this, this is confusing me more than having to think think of how to express these ideas in my own language. And so that's a question I think as decolonizers, we need to put more effort into thinking about. The related question is this idea of making our ontic commitments explicit. So um, it's something I've begun to think about in my own teaching. Uh, for example, I teach, you know, I teach uh, cr critical thinking and logic to a group of, of first year South African students. Um, and I'm constantly aware that the way I attempt to explain things might not uh, make sense to the people listening to what I'm saying. And it's not because uh, they can't understand me or that there's something wrong with them. It's that I'm using my own set of metaphysical commitments, my own sort of examples, uh, my own ontic framework in order to, to try and pass this knowledge onto them. Another good example in the work we do at ACEPS is in the work around decolonizing medicine in South Africa. So in South Africa, we have, uh, we have a really good, efficient, mainstream uh, medical ecosystem. Uh, we have doctors in the Western sense and hospitals and all of these things. At the same time, we have a, the phenomenon of uh, multiple consultations. So the typical South African is comfortable consulting a Western doctor, but at the same time and for the same ailment uh, would consult a traditional healer and get sort of a, a herbal remedy or even some sort of uh, spiritual explanation for what's going on uh, with their illness. And in the debate about these uh, different medical traditions, uh, there's two ways of looking at it. So the one is a way that does not take the ontic question seriously. So for example, we have uh, institutions, we have people who say, it's fine to incorporate traditional medicine into the mainstream ecosystem. All that needs to happen is that we take these cures from traditional healers. Let's say it's a herbal cure and we do chemical analysis on that herb and we find out what the active ingredient in that herb is, or we do some sort of an RCT and we see whether it's really effective. Um, and if that's the case, if it passes those tests, then we can say, yes, this, uh, you know, this, this uh, cure can be incorporated into, into mainstream medicine. But to do that, leaves aside the question of the ontic. For almost every single cure that you are going to get from a traditional healer, it would make absolutely no sense if you strip the metaphysical underpinnings of the way that cure is supposed to work and what it's meant to work for. So again, in, in the context of, of philosophy of medicine and its decolonization, I think the, the ontic question uh, becomes really important. And then finally, uh, and probably most worryingly, uh, I think that Vedan's work, and especially this idea of the interconnectedness of everything, so the fact that my understanding of a scientific concept is linked to my understanding of language, my idea of what knowledge is, also is related to my understanding of language, which is uh, 
underpinned by these metaphysical or ontic questions. And so everything is kind of related to everything else. It doesn't bode well for the direction I think decolonization is going in. So in the first wave of decolonization, which was largely inspired by political decolonization, there was this definition of decolonization as one framework replacing another framework. So in this context, think, think about Fanon. Okay, so decolonization was meant to be this process where the first shall be last and, and vice versa, and where we, we would have this wholesale sort of replacement of one epistemic system with a different epistemic system. And I think gradually over time, what we've uh, gravitated towards is a completely different conception of what decolonization is. So when we were confronted with the imperative to decolonize, our senior management basically gave us the message that this was a good idea. Uh, we all needed to decolonize, but they couldn't really give us any guidance about what decolonization meant. So they encouraged each faculty, each department to basically brainstorm and, and come to some sort of understanding um, in, in these smaller groups about what decolonization would, would mean for a philosophy department, for a, a physics department, for a, uh, a language department. And I think that's the paradigm we've been stuck with at the, at the moment. We have this uh, silo uh, mentality where I can decolonize within my own sort of sphere of influence. influence. Uh, but I think if we take Vedan's message on board that all of these different spheres of knowledge are actually interconnected and that decolonizing one while holding the rest constant is, is not feasible, um, then it seems like even the new path that we are on in terms of what decolonization is, is also bound to fail. Um, so those are the four uh, messages, the four lessons I take from uh, Vedan's account. Um, and I think, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there and I'll see what people make of it and, and if there are any questions. And hopefully I'll have enough power to stay on until the last question's answered. <laughs> Thank you.